Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce Yi Hong Wu from Yale University. Yi Hong is an information theorist working in, uh, well, information theory, statistics, combinatorial optimization sometimes. Today he's going to talk about the EM algorithm. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks to the organizer for the uh, invitation. Uh, so I'll, I will report some results from last year about uh, statistical and computational guarantees of uh, EM algorithm uh, with the emphasis on, on random initialization. So it's a very popular uh, algorithm in statistics for latent variable models. Um, and this is joint work with Harrison and Joe. Uh, so as opposed to complex structures, uh, I will describe uh, the results on uh, very simple models, uh, even a bit simplistic. And then towards the end, uh, I will describe some uh, uh, less simple models, but still very simple. Uh, okay, so I'll start with a, a quick recap of the EM algorithm. The heuristics is following. Uh, suppose you have a, uh, a statistical model for uh, uh, a latent variable x and observable y, and with the unknown parameter theta, uh, theta star you know the ground truth. And then uh, observing y, you want to learn something about theta star. Um, and suppose uh, uh, you want to compute maximum likelihood, uh, which entails maximizing the marginal uh, law of, of y uh, over theta. Uh, in many situations, uh, this is a uh, non-convex uh, optimization problem. Uh, and the heuristics of EM algorithm, which was proposed in the 70s, and this is one of the most cited paper in statistics, uh, consists of the following uh, recipe. Uh, suppose I have initial guess theta zero of, of uh, the unknown parameter. Let me uh, iterate the following two steps. One is the E step. Uh, I'm going to compute uh, the joint likelihood average over the uh, conditional distribution. Uh, of course, I need to average out the latent, pretending theta zero is a true parameter. Uh, and then the objective is called Q. And then the M step is to maximize over Q and produce the next iterates and update and, and, then, uh, and then continue. Okay. And then the motivation, or one of the way to interpret it is instead of maximizing the true log likelihood, I'm maximizing a lower bound um, uh, and then subtracting the Kubelaiba divergence of the conditionals. And then a corollary of this interpretation is that these heuristics always ensures uh, the likelihood value does not go down. But uh, as I will show in the next slides, uh, there is in general no guarantees of uh, what does it converge to, uh, whether it's a statistically sound estimate or not. So uh, as I said in the beginning, I will analyze a very simple model, very popular model, where you can say something uh, more precise. And then towards the end, uh, I mention some more recent results on uh, less restrictive models. So this is the cleanest uh, Gaussian mixture model uh, you can write down, which is two components. There's two Gaussians, uh, equally weighted, superimposed on top of each other. Um, you can think about this in terms of the latent variable notations. Each sample, y, is equal to a, a unobserved uh, label plus minus one, uh, rather than one half, times the true center, theta star, plus some Gaussian noise, yeah? Independent of the label. Um, and so if you write down the marginal distribution, y consists of an equal mixture of two Gaussians, one center at plus theta star, one center at minus theta star. And the goal is to learn theta star based on n samples of this model. So uh, of course, theta star is only identified up to a global uh, sign flip, right? Because minus and plus theta star are the same quantity. Uh, so the loss function naturally uh, is of the following form. I measure my accuracy to theta star or uh, minus theta star, which one is better, yeah? Okay, so it's relatively easy to show uh, the, what is the statistical limit of this model. Uh, it's very simple exercise. Uh, the result is in, in the sense of uh, minimax optimality. Uh, by rate throughout the talk, I meant within constant factors. Uh, this is given by dimension over sample size to the one quarter. Uh, and then this can be easily achieved by just doing a PZA. Uh, okay, and the question is that we want to answer 
is not to achieve uh, the optimal rate in this model, because it's very simple, uh, but to ask, uh, you know, essentially as a proof concept, is it possible to prove EM uh, enjoys the same optimality? After all, it's designed to approximate maximum likelihood. Uh, if, if so, uh, how many iterations are needed? Right? So, and the global assumption I'm going to make uh, is the center uh, lives in a bounded ball. So this assumption doesn't make the uh, change the uh, optimality optimal rate. Uh, and then this assumption is essentially the most interesting case for parameter estimation as opposed to clustering. Of course, if you want to cluster uh, you know, most of the labels correctly, you need the centers to be uh, quite separated. Uh, but for estimation, there's, it's not needed. Furthermore, um, even if you allow theta star to be equal to zero, in other words, uh, the statistician postulates a two Gaussian, but in reality, the uh, data coming from uh, a single Gaussian, uh, you, know, you, can, you can still estimate theta star, in which case you should uh, try to get close to zero. So uh, let me repeat, I'm going to assume upper bound and the normal of the center and uh, assume no lower bound of the center. And this is um, quite standard. So if you uh, execute the recipe of EM algorithm on the first page, uh, it's very simple form. Uh, it's an empirical mean of each sample, essentially weighted by uh, estimates of its label. Right? The estimate takes real values between plus minus ones uh, and try to do this sign correction and average them. Right? So that's the interpretation. Uh, throughout the talk, I'm going to write n sample average as expectation uh, sub n. Uh, and then as you see that usually for this type of analysis, uh, one should first uh, ensure as, as, a, as a premise that the population version, which means you have infinite number of samples, the dynamics is doing the right thing. So uh, by which I meant uh, the n sample average is replaced by the true average over the true parameter theta star, which is not seen. Okay, so equivalently, you can see that uh, in this case, the EM algorithm is exactly the same as running uh, the first order method gradient ascent uh, with step size exactly equal to one uh, applied on this uh, non-convex log likelihood. Right, so this is uh, another interpretation. And then this happens for any mixture of Gaussians as long as the centers have the same norm. Okay, and then there is a, there is a, a huge literature on understanding uh, EM algorithm in different models at various different positions in both statistics, machine learning. And then I'll highlight some recent results. Um, so one of them is by uh, Balakrishnan et al. Uh, uh, who proposed a general framework of analyzing EM uh, on the basis of uh, contraction of the population EM, right? And then by uh, concentration, one can say something about finite samples. So uh, specializing this result uh, to uh, symmetric two Gaussians, um, uh, they obtained the following results. Uh, EM is great, converged to very good estimates, uh, provided following uh, very strong conditions. One is uh, you need to have uh, you know, separation, significant separation between the uh, centers. Uh, doesn't need to go to infinity, but needs to be some large constant. And also you need to have a very warm start uh, in the sense of the initializer uh, needs to fulfill the condition. Uh, essentially, it needs to have a you know, much better than random guess, right? So, okay, and then... Uh, what do you mean by assuming contraction? Of the, 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 the so it's a very general framework that says if the population EM map satisfy three conditions, in particular, uh, contraction near the fixed point at the ground truth, uh, then there's a theory, then they check the conditions for three different models. So roughly that's the structure of the paper. Uh, okay, so then there are two more results, um, uh, analyzing EM in more uh, refined um, you know, manner for this metric to Gaussian model, uh, where uh, you know, they show the uh, population landscape of the objective function is good in the following sense. Uh, there's a global, okay, global max, if you look at the uh, log likelihood, at uh, the ground truth, right? There is by symmetry two of them. And then usually because of this symmetry problem, there's something in between, which is a saddle as zero. So uh, this was proved by uh, Xu et al. Uh, 
uh, in the same paper, they also analyzed uh, you know, as a corollary if the dimension is fixed and sample size goes to infinity, essentially by law of large numbers, you can say the convergence of EM, but uh, it's hard to extend such argument to high dimensions. And then uh, uh, the results of uh, Costis and his co-authors uh, push this uh, one step further, uh, where they analyze a version of the EM algorithm, where each iteration use some fresh samples, and then um, if you run EM for a few number of iterations, uh, renormalize the uh, iterates, then run it again, it will converge to a very good estimate, even in high dimensions. Right? So it was a very nice result, these two papers. Um, so this talk, I will uh, try to uh, present, uh, try to focus on the following settings. Uh, first of all, I want to analyze things when dimension d is on par with n uh, for finite n and finite d, both could be very large. And then second thing is, uh, I, I will try to restrict myself to the vanilla version of the EM. There is no uh, super samples, there is no restart, uh, just run till convergence say. And also, as opposed to a warm start, uh, I will uh, analyze what happens if you randomly initialize, say draw something uniformly from the sphere, which is what people do in practice. Uh, people usually just randomly initialize or randomly initialize for a few times and then run each EM to your convergence and pick the one with the highest likelihood. So all of these are very uh, uh, popular practice. Um, so, okay, so, um, and then as I said before, uh, I will not assume anything about separations. And this is known for already for a long time. Um, it converges even there is only one component. So standard normal data, you postulate two Gaussians, still converges, uh, but quite slow. And this is observed in an earlier review paper uh, in the 80s on EM. Poorly separation leads to slow convergence. Uh, quantitatively, how slow it is, uh, it's not fully understood. So the question, precise question I want to address is how many iterations are needed for the EM algorithm to reach the statistical optimal estimates, if this is, if at all this is possible. Okay, so, so I will proceed uh, as a warm up, discuss what happens in one dimension. Uh, this is a simple exercise that you, that, you know, you can assign to, to, a, to a class. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, just a quick question. Just yeah. Um, just in terms of the, like, the landscape of this sort of thing, so yeah. for like the asymmetric general covariance case of just two Gaussians, right. um, does EM, should EM still converge? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, two components, asymmetric. Uh, I remember a result which I'll mention toward the end. Uh, equally weighted three Gaussians, in one dimension there exists some saddle point. Which is not the ground truth. It was Jing at all, yeah. Does it exist a local optimum? Or? Uh, I don't exactly remember, but it's definitely a critical point. For, for, two, for two Gaussians, you invite like, uh, like uh, a pair of two pairs, you know, there, there is a super restrict point at the end with, like, with a big phase in the attraction. And so this, sorry, so this is, un, this is a possibly different weights and different, different variances? Did you yeah. try and show? Yeah, so the three components one is also you know it's one third and you run the one according to the one third model and there is some, yeah. Uh, okay, in this case, the uh, p at least the population landscape is good. Um, okay, so any other questions? All right, so I'll describe what happens in one dimensions uh, very quickly. Uh, and this is a, just a simplification of the population version of the EM map and the sample version. Uh, where there is some non-linearities. Okay, uh, uh, so the main results uh, uh, is the following. Uh, it's a uh, statistical guarantee uh, uh, in conjunction with a computational one. So it doesn't matter where you initialize as long as you don't, <laughs> you know, initialize zero where you stay at zero. 
uh, for all iterations exceeds uh, the following. Uh, minimum of root n and 1 over theta star square times the log factor is needed to absorb the initialization. Uh, the, uh, guarantee the EM uh, reaches the optimal rate. So, and then this is, uh, let me make a few comments. There is no condition on the initialization. Uh, but this is only uh, native to one dimensions. Uh, if you start from theta 0 as 0.1, it will converge to the optimal rate in at most root n iterations, regardless of theta star. Right? If you want to write down a stopping criteria, uh, you, don't, you don't want something that involves the ground truth. And then you can always stop at root n iterations. And then th th there is a uh, couple of papers from uh, Duavadi et al. Uh, from Berkeley group with, uh, yeah, with a few authors. Uh, they proved the uh, similar results for more general models, uh, focusing on a special case where you have theta star equal to zero. Right? So you, post you over postulate your model uh, and what happens. And then uh, they also prove these results in this special case. OK, so, so I will mention uh, two things very uh, briefly about the proof ingredients. And these things will show up again in multiple dimensions, uh, but they are not the hardest part. So one. Th yeah, please. This is not, theta t is not converging to the MLE, is it? Theta t is, uh, it, I think, yeah, it, it converges to, I think so. Yeah. The MLE? Yes, at least, uh, uh, at least if you postulate theta star exceeds uh, 1 over a quarter, uh, it converges. Yeah. yeah, so I didn't state it here, but it does. Uh, okay, so one is you need to uh, say something, some quantitative con uh, property about the contraction of the population version. And the second thing is uh, a concentration of the EM trajectory, uh, slightly different than before, uh, but still very simple. So I'll explain. The first one is uh, uh, you need to ensure uh, in the presence of infinite samples, this, the algorithm is doing the right thing. So if you plot the f function, the, the iterative map, uh, for theta star equal to one half, and you will see that there are two fixed points. One is the correct one, one is the one at zero, unstable and stable. So it doesn't matter where you start, you're going to converge to the right one, even if you're very, very close to zero, right? You're going to escape. <coughs> and of course, this is infinite uh, samples. And then the contraction that you can prove, and this is known for a long time, is uh, there is a, as long as theta star is not zero, there's strict contraction. The contraction quality, of course, depends on theta star. Um, OK, but what happens if theta star is exactly equal to 0? And there is one fixed point as theta x star equal to 0. So essentially, the, the, the two fixed points merged. Uh, but uh, this picture also shows you that it's not possible to prove a strict contraction in this case, because the curve, the blue one, kisses the uh, 45 degrees at 0. Uh, so there is no strict contraction, but it's, you know, then you just need to look at the second order term. It turns out uh, there is a nonlinear contraction. Uh, you're going to minus a, a, a cubic term. Um, and then when you go down the, the staircase, you converge to the unique fixed point. Yeah? So this, you can al also derive very quickly a convergence rate, which is 1 over square root of t. So not linear convergence, much slower, uh, but it is what it is. And this is all, you know, essentially can be blamed to the flatness of the likelihood at, at theta 0 the vanishing fissure information, and so on and so forth. And these are responsible for uh, the slow st statistical rate and also the slow convergence rate. Right? So and this is very simple. OK, so now if you want to pass from the population to sample, you need some result that says they behave similarly. Right? So uh, one thing that people usually do is, because theta t depend on the, all the samples, you, I'm not splitting samples, I'm iterating the same data over and over again. So theta t depends horribly on all the samples. So if, if I want to swoop it out, I need to run some union bound. So, uh, so if you can prove indeed that the trajectory of the EM, the population and the sample version are close to each other in the following sense, uh, you can first show from first principles with high probability it doesn't leave a, a compact ball. And within this compact ball, Regardless of where theta is, uh, the n sample and infinite sample sends both of them uh, to two different places, which is no more than the square root of d over n with high probability. And this is very easy to prove, but you will see that it's not sufficient to prove the results that I announced in the beginning. Uh, what you need is a relative deviation in the following sense. 
uh, you need to capture the following phenomena. If theta itself is very small, the deviations should be small proportionally as well. So this will allow you to uh, be unstuck at any uh, you know, uh, potentially uh, bad fixed point. So uh, in mathematically, it means the deviation divided by theta itself is bounded by the same quantity. And you can show this very easily. Uh, and this slice is for any dimensions, even d goes to infinity. Uh, and then in one dimension, uh, it's very easy to prove. You can show the difference of the finite sample and the infinite sample as a function is Lipschitz and the Lipschitz constant exactly uh, the one Wasserstein distance between the population and the empirical, which behave like 1 over root n. Of course, in d dimensions, this is bad um, because it behaves like n to the minus 1 over d. But then you do something else. So, so this is easy to show. Okay, so essentially, uh, so once you apply the result, you can uh, lift the infinite sample results to finite sample by doing the following thing. You can show uh, that the uh, n sample trajectory, it doesn't matter where it is, is sandwiched between these two dashed blue curves. The central solid blue curve is what happens with infinite samples. And then there is two linear perturbation of this as it blows upper and lower bounds. And then they move the fixed points a little bit as well. And then you're going to guarantee to converge to uh, somewhere in between. Uh, and then the distance between these is exactly what you can hope for statistically. Okay, so that's, that's the whole proof. And then uh, I want to uh, show you that it's important to have this perturbation bound proportional to theta. Uh, otherwise, let's say the lower boundary is going to be shifted vertically let's say downwards, then this blue curve is going to have some crossing here. If you start with very low signal, uh, you cannot say easily that you will not be stuck here. Right? So at least this program doesn't generalize easily if you do not have such a multiplicative uh, bound. Okay? And here is a, a one more example. Uh, it shows you this is uh, uh, what you should hope for. And you can guess this by computing the variance of the deviation. You know, the standard deviation is proportional to theta. So that's what you should. Sh yes, please. So, um, so when you look at the ratio, uh, because you take the ratio, because yeah, yeah. it depends on the theta, yeah. it's possible that you can remove the upper bound on the theta when you take the superior one, right? I'm, can, can you repeat? The yes, the ratio, the correct. Less equal than constant. Uh -huh. C, less equal than constant is very crucial when you don't normalize by theta. Uh, theta, it is, I mean, w the analysis we, we did was a bit crude. So C is some constant. Um, I cannot say, I mean, it's possible, uh, but I mean, w w we, w we tried, uh, but we didn't succeed. We didn't try like super hard, but it's possible. Uh, okay, so here's uh, what happens in action. If you want to analyze what happens when you have one Gaussian and you, you know, want to converge to zero, uh, this is what happens uh, you know, near zero. If you do not have uh, theta here, you're going to get one over six. You have a theta, you get one over a quarter, which is right, right? So this, is, this should be convincing. And of course, you can prove it for all theta star. Okay, uh, I, I, will sh uh, I will next move on to the more interesting case of uh, D dimensions. And then just one more time of this is what you need to analyze. The finite sample version and the infinite sample version, and here is the inner product of theta and y. Both of them are d-dimensional uh, random quantities. OK, so first, and then this is also known uh, since the previous work of Xu et al. and uh, Costis and his co-authors, uh, one can describe this d-dimensional evolution essentially by a two-dimensional one by projecting onto the signal part, right? So th ground truth, this is the ground truth direction. I project onto that, get alpha, which is a scalar, and then the rest of the energy on the, on the rest, right, beta. And then these two quantities uh, describe the, can describe the success of the convergence. Convergence to the star is equivalent to beta get, van uh, get killed and alpha converge to either plus or minus the star norm. And then uh, this two-dimensional system completely describe uh, the evolution of this, uh, of this thing. Um, for some f, I didn't write it down, I, but it's easy. Uh, so, uh, and the following result was proved uh, before as, you know, this is equivalent to show the landscape property of the log likelihood. If you start with something, in other words, you start with alpha equal to zero, you're going to get stuck. And beta goes to zero regardless. So you go into the saddle because you exactly hit this point where it's orthogonal to that. 
Uh, otherwise, if you have a little bit of signal, you're going to uh, converge uh, you know, to plus or minus. So this is known before. So I want to uh, uh, you know, show you a little bit of what happened, what really happens. Uh, so here is a plot of, again, infinite samples. Uh, but you can already see something different than one dimensions. So this, this is when alpha, when I initialize at this point, so I move along the EM map and I go at this point and I converged, right? So beta vanished and alpha converged to a normal of their star. Uh, the, and the process is very pleasant, it's monotone and so on and so forth, just like in one dimensions. Uh, but this, is n this need not be the case uh, if uh, the initial angle is very bad. Uh, beta is much bigger than alpha. Uh, there is a phase that you cannot uh, avoid even if you have n samples, infinite samples, where beta, of course, goes to zero. And alpha, you start with 0.1, which is pretty bad, but then you get even worse. Why? Because there is a direction on the orthogonal uh, uh, direction that, that makes your signal getting weaker and weaker. And, and then somehow it overcomes this uh, this interference and then start to grow again. So, so uh, alpha need not converge monotonically and then uh, due to the most of the energy happening on the wrong direction and then it in fact can get very very close to zero. Of course you can show that if you uh, have infinite samples you will never get to zero. You can get very very close but never exact. Um, but this is something one should think if you have n samples what if you are within the mercy of one over, you know, CLT, right? So, um, can you can you actually, you know, make a comeback? And then this picture exactly is what happens if you randomly initialize, because in high dimensions, if you random draw a direction, the uh, the overlap with the true uh, direction is one over root d, right? So this is everyone knows, uh, and then this is precisely the difficulty of of uh, random initialization. Uh, I will just first uh, present the main results and then tell you what is the main challenge. Um, so the results says the EM initialized once randomly uh, uh, is good in the following sense. So if you draw a random direction, uh, eta is zero, and initialize very close to zero using this random direction, right? This, this number you can compute, it's not it's, uh, it's, it's, it's observed. Uh, suppose n is just a little bit bigger than d. And then with high probability, uh, very similar to what happens in one dimensions, uh, with this amount of iterations, at most root n. Again, right? if theta star is good, then maybe log n is good, uh, is enough. It reaches uh, the optimal rate within a uh, log factor. Right? So this we cannot get rid of. Right? So very similar to what happens when d equal to 1. Uh, in addition, and this is uh, how I answered Philippe's question earlier, if the signal is just a bit bigger than the essentially where you cannot test whether it exists or not, uh, then it converges to MLE. Um, okay, so uh, a few uh, comments. As I said before, a single random, random initialization uh, works. Uh, there's no need to use expensive spectral uh, initialization and there is no need to split samples uh, and then the one thing I need to point out is the current proof requires you to initialize quite close to zero and this has almost no effect computationally because this gets washed out logarithmically very fast right so it most increase one log iterations uh, but it's something uh, I mean I cannot convince me that if I initialize on the unit sphere I converge as well so I cannot prove that um, uh, okay, so so let me uh, spend uh, next uh, ten minutes on the uh, how it was proved and the main uh, challenge. Uh, so, if you want to extend the one-dimensional program to d dimensions, uh, there is only certain uh, you can only go s so far uh, to uh, to the following point. So, it's easy, very easy to prove, as I mentioned before. Uh, infinite sample leads to complete convergence of the, you know, the beta to zero. If you have n sample, it's converged to essentially the optimal rate without any conditions. Right? This is easy. Now, uh, but what happens is that now you're going to have this vertical perturbation as opposed to this linear perturbation. Right? That's always make you make these two sandwich point pass to zero. 
But now, because of the presence of beta, the only thing you can uh, hope for, if you want to repeat this program, that let's suppose beta has already converged at the optimal rate. You cannot hope for better, right? This, because this is natural fluctuation. Uh, it will move this curve uh, downwards so that there is a point which potentially you can get stuck. And then what if, if you initialize here, then if you follow the sandwich bound, uh, you can only show that uh, you, know, you cannot uh, conclude that you will not be stuck there. So, so this is something that's uh, uh, not happening in one dimensions. And, then, and this is very severe in high dimensions, as I said before. OK, so it requires some new uh, uh, ingredients to, uh, to essentially to show that somehow this point can be uh, avoided, even if I start with almost zero signal. So the analysis consists of three phases. I only focus on one of them, the most interesting one, which is the initial one. Suppose your alpha starts with something very small, which is what happens if you random draw. And then there is going to enjoy initial exponential growth at uh, exponent essentially 1 over theta star square. And after that, once it goes above this critical threshold, which is essentially the optimal rate, then evolves as if in one dimensions with, a, again, a linear perturbation uh, that you can just you know, call the one dimensional results. And the only difference is that theta star, this high dimensional vector, is replaced by its norm. And now the, second, the third phase is exponential convergence to maximum likelihood. And this is also not hard. So the most challenging part is to show that uh, you're not going to be bogged down by, uh, by the small signal if you initialize randomly. And then this is what I will focus on. Uh, the analysis only works for Gaussians uh, uh, because it heavily uh, relies on the rotational invariance of the Gaussian law. So recall that alpha is the projection onto the ground truth direction, and beta is the rest. Uh, thanks to Gaussianity, I can assume the ground truth is a coordinate vector right? by just you know, change of basis. Uh, in other words, all my signal is concentrated on the first coordinate, and the rest are zeros. Um, so my data, uh, if I so my so I will decompose as before, my theta according to the true direction, which is the first coordinate, and then the rest, and the, the size of the rest is my beta t, right? So correspondingly, each sample has the following structure: the first coordinate is a one-dimensional two-Gaussian. And the rest are standard noise, are standard Gaussian noise. So of course, the algorithm doesn't know this. This is for analysis only. So the crucial idea of the analysis is of a Li one now type. Um, the idea is this. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you repeatedly use, uh, you know, because everything is dependent, so I just soup it out, take the d-dimensional union bound, you're going to get these root d factors that will not give you what you need. So there is, and the typically, uh, leave one now analysis is done by changing some coordinates a little bit and swap it to something independent so you can apply central limit theorem and then control uh, you know, the loss due to the one that you left out. So this is, uh, the execution of this idea is the following. Uh, yi is a true sample. Let me introduce a fake sample by uh, re replenish the signal part with independent copy. So. Uh, the second and the third and the d coordinates are exactly the same, but the first one I re regenerate, and I feed the true sample to generate the sequence I want to analyze, and I feed the uh, fake sample to generate uh, uh, iteration uh, for auxiliary purposes. Right? So theta tilde is the one with the, you know, with the uh, regenerated randomness, so it never seeing the true label. And then this gives you a trajectory, uh, theta t. And then there is a true trajectory that I want to analyze. And they are cut out through two things. One is they initialize at the same point. So this is random. And the second thing is the data on the orthogonal direction are also coupled. right? So they, they evolve in this way. But the first signal is, is the same. And then by definition, as I said before, the fake sequence uh, haven't seen the first coordinate before. So whenever these two things, uh, you know, are in the same sum, I can happily apply central limit theorem or Gaussian concentration. Right? 
So, and then indeed uh, the profit is uh, to substitute the true sequence with the fake sequence to improve upon just dumb union bound the factor of square root d. And of course, you need to control the difference of the true sequence and the fake sequence. And then, and then here is the key point. The key point is the following: throughout the phase one, which is this, before you can you leave that potentially bad point, uh, these two sequence grows uh, quite close to each other in the following sense: um, the proportional to alpha t, the initial signal that you want to grow it, right? So the intuition is the following. Uh, if alpha is zero, right, so you have no signal on the true coordinate, uh, theta, uh, tilde and theta are exactly the same if you have infinite samples. And if you have a finite number of samples, you should expect them to be uh, close to each other and hopefully close to alpha as well. Uh, and next slide will show you the, why this is important. And this technique, this specific uh, leave one out technique was introduced in a paper of Yuxing Chen and his co-authors for analyzing gradient descent for the purpose of phase retrieval. Uh, and they use this, uh, leave one coordinate out, right, refresh the label, in conjunction with leave one sample out, leave one observation out. And here, um, because some special property of the EM, we're able to um, you know, make the analysis more compact. Uh, so it, uh, uh, but the main idea is due to the Chen et al. paper. Okay, so here let me try to execute it just in one step. I will suppress a lot of details, but just want to show you that how it was used. Uh, it's a very generic idea. So here's the evolution of the signal part, right? My signal is concentrated on the first coordinate. So it's just y1 times this uh, hyperbolic tangent function. Uh, and the theta, remember, depends on all the samples, so it's horribly dependent. Uh, first, uh, let me just approximate it linearly, right? So this linear approximation and the nonlinear part, I will suppress the nonlinear approximation. It's not small, but you just need to uh, deal with it also. Uh, so l let me just suppress it for the talk. Uh, and then I, I will separate the first coordinate that give you the exponential growth I desire. Right? So this is exactly concentrated on 1 plus theta star square plus the rest, uh, which I need to control, which is probably zero mean, who knows, now here is uh, what happens, it, the whole point of introducing the fake sequence is to substitute it in. Now, once the blue part is in, the inner product is independent of the first coordinate. Remember, this is a n sample average. So I can apply Gaussian concentration here. Uh, otherwise, I cannot. Now there is a difference of the true sequence and the auxiliary sequence, which I need to control. Right? So one is one over square root of n, and this one, OK, I need to soup out something at some point. right? You cannot hope to deal with dependency. You know, you never do it. So you need to do it at some point. So it was done here. Uh, but the uh, good news is that the one I souped out is the difference of the main sequence and the fake sequence. Uh, and then this one is small, uh, proportionally small to the true alpha. So if I com compare everything, the uh, possible damage, because this could be negative, does not kill my growth. Right? So it's important to have alpha here, otherwise you're going to back in the original situation. So this is very heuristics, but at least uh, two things. One, exponential growth comes from, you know, essentially uh, Taylor expansion, and then the rest, there is a lot of things I didn't discuss. And then, then the uh, powerfulness of this technique is that uh, it's, it's, it's essentially it's a, uh, it's uh, a way to analyze these dynamics right, by introducing auxiliary one. So the formula what you need to show is, of course, not that simple. Uh, you need to show by induction on t. Uh, as long as you do not exit phase one, uh, alpha grow exponentially, but the difference between the main sequence and the fake sequence also grows exponentially. But somehow this you can tolerate as long as you don't iterate too much. Okay, I'm not saying you should stop the iteration. I said the analysis just works for these now iterations. <coughs> then you can switch to a very simple one. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? So it's a very nice technique that uh, I find it very useful and it was exactly uh, what we need to do here. Any questions? No? Okay, so uh, 
uh, in the next, uh, uh, what do I, four minutes, three minutes, yeah. So I will just present some uh, less restrictive results, more or less in preparation of the open problem I want to mention. So if you don't have symmetric two Gaussians, uh, you know, just generic K Gaussians, uh, here I'm not even touching this covariance part, so location mixtures, but high dimensional. Um, so you can study the same problem of parameter estimation and uh, also density estimation, and neither of them require separation. So parameter estimation, there's many ways to formulate it. One of them, uh, perhaps, you know, at least pedagogically the, the most clean one, is to identify the parameters as the distribution that's usually called a mixing distribution, right? Essentially, the location mixture is a convolution of standard normal with this distribution that encodes the weights and the locations. And then, then you don't need to say, you know, up to a permutation or so on and so forth. And you don't need to assume the weights is big. Uh, so parameters by which I meant the, just the mixing distribution. And then you can estimate the distribution using some meaningful loss function. And the Wasserstein distance is something um, that's meaningful here. In the special case of symmetric two Gaussians, you can compute the Wasserstein distance between these two plus minus thetas and plus minus theta stars. That's exactly the loss function I mentioned before. It's a very simple exercise. And also density estimation, but I will insist on uh, proper estimates. In other words, my estimates also needs to be a K Gaussian. So, and, uh, and this is, people know this uh, from a long time ago, for some of the authors in the audience. Uh, for these two things, there's no need to assume any separations. And then the two results I want to mention is for parameter estimation, uh, one can show, uh, one can determine what is the optimal rate. And also there is an algorithm that at least theoretically runs in polynomial time. Uh, and this extends the previous one dimensional result of hiring and Khan. And but for density estimation, uh, we recently determined the exact rate. So there is no logarithmic slack and this was the hard part. So the, with logarithmic slack, uh, this was uh, determined by Ashtiani et al. last year in NIPS, in NURIPS, sorry. Uh, and then this work removes the log factors. Uh, the, uh, the, you only need to show the upper bound. It's not algorithmic, uh, so it's based on computing a very precise <coughs> local uh, entropy bound, uh, then by which you can just call the construction of uh, Lacan Birger, uh, this uh, pairwise you know, tournament construction, testimator, if you will. Uh, and the construction of the covering is by means of moment tensors, and this might suggest tensor method is good, but we cannot analyze it. And then I uh, just want to mention that it seems to this day uh, there's no polynomial time algorithm that achieved the rate, of course, even within log factors. And the, the state of the art uh, is uh, one quarter. So I think this was a very nice problem. So I'll conclude now. Um, I presented uh, uh, guarantees for EM algorithm for a very simple toy model. Uh, in high dimension, there's a few interesting effect is that uh, optimal rate can be retrieved in one dimensions, you know, independent of initialization. In high dimensions, near optimal rate can be achieved also in root n iterations, even in the absolute worst case, uh, if you just initialize randomly once. Uh, open problem, as I mentioned before, I believe, and also in simulation that is the case, Initialize on the unit sphere seems to be sufficiently fine, uh, but I cannot uh, prove it. I mean, we cannot prove it. Uh, so right now, it's essentially uh, for technical convenience, uh, and then you can compute it anyways. Right? Doesn't require extra knowledge, but I think it's uh, it's probably not super easy to show. And also for EM, uh, because the convergence of maximum likelihood, one should hope for that. Um, it can achieve asymptotic efficiency. Right? So how to quantify this in high dimensions, uh, it's not super clear to me. And uh, as I said, uh, analyzing EM for more general models, uh, some of them uh, the audience already mentioned, for K-mixture of Gaussians, it's possible there is potentially bad critical point or bad uh, local minimums. Uh, but if you initialize randomly, let's say for log n times, right, you run your, maybe you will escape it, at some point, 
for which likelihood will be higher. So there is a chance that still works. And that's what people do in practice, right? You just run EM in parallel for 10 times and you pick the best one. Uh, for other mixture of Gaussian special case, including uh, the problem of MRA, uh, which is also uh, a specific instance of mixture of Gaussians, uh, I think uh, it's in of interest to understand what EM does in this model has also had a lot of symmetry. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slides, density estimates, essentially this high dimensional density estimates seems like an interesting problem, especially, especially algorithmically. Uh, I mean, I think to this day there is not only, you know, there is nothing even better than one quarter. You know, point 0.3 is not known. And then these are the references. Thank you very much.